Welcome to our webinar on the 10C Ready Update. We are delighted to have with us this evening Commissioner of Education Dr. Candace McQueen. Dr. McQueen was sworn in as Tennessee's Commissioner of Education on January 17, 2015. Previously, she served as Senior Vice President and Dean of the College of Education at Lipscomb University. Dr. McQueen began her career as a classroom teacher teaching in both public and private elementary and middle schools. And we are also delighted to have Dr. Nakia Towns, who is Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Data and Research at the Tennessee Department of Education. Prior to her role at the department, she was Chief Accountability Officer for the Knox County Schools, as well as the Director of Human Capital Strategy and a Practitioner Partner for the UT Leadership Academy. And now I would like to tell you um, they will have somebody to answer as many questions as possible live on the air. If we don't get to all of those questions, I, they are recorded and they will be forwarded to the department and they will be able to answer you personally. So at this point, I'm going to change the presenter to Dr. McQueen and Dr. Towns and they will have it from here. Well, good evening. It's um, great to be here with you, and I'm looking forward to taking an opportunity to share some updates on TN Ready and address some questions with Dr. Towns. In particular, we were planning to do a TN Ready webinar with um, some of our PET teachers for, um, I guess, quite a while now. We're glad we've had an opportunity now to schedule that um, after we have made some of the um, changes from online to paper and so we can also address questions that would be related to that transition. I want to start by sharing what is TN Ready to make sure we're starting from the same um, place. TN Ready is our new and improved TCAP test in English Language Arts and Math for grades 3 through 11. It is part of our TCAP program, our, our comprehensive assessment program in Tennessee. TCAP includes, as you know, our, our 3 through 8 achievement test and end of course exams for science, social studies, math, and English, and TN Ready is part of that entire package. The new test in math and ELA will have fewer and better questions, and it's truly designed in a way to assess true student understanding, not just basic memorization and test taking skills. The idea of this test was to truly move our students to be fully aligned to the work that we've been doing in our classrooms and, and to test on that alignment. Um, as you know, that this, this particular test will include writing and more for performance tasks, particularly in part one of now a two-part test. So why do we need TN Ready? What was the impetus that really moved us to this new test in Tennessee? As many of you know, uh, teachers on, on the line, you know that over time we have had a, a change since 2007, 2008 in our standards. We started improving our standards over the last decade, and with those improvements, we've made efforts to align our assessments to those standards. The reason we have changed standards and really looked at our high expectations in the state are related to what we know about the early years after high school. Our Tennessee students do struggle typically after high school based on certain decisions that they're making. The data or the pie chart that you're seeing on the screen now shows a, a really a snapshot of a group of high school freshmen that would have started high school in 2008. This represents about 71,403 students. If you look at the pie graph, you're going to note that we had about 13% of this group that did not graduate, which is a little over 9,000 students, and that's represented in the, the Navy portion of the pie graph. If you look at the group that is uh, the largest portion, so the 13% is the smallest, the largest portion is um, encouraging. This is the group of students who actually make a decision upon graduation to go directly into post-secondary and that represents around 56% of our students. The group in the middle, the 31%, is represented by the students who do graduate from high school but choose to go on directly into the workplace and are not going on into any kind of credentialing program. If you look at that group and, and their earning power, 
we know from following them through our P20 database where we can look at our labor data, certainly our post-secondary data and connections to K-12, we know that the group that goes directly into the workforce without moving into post-secondary makes an average salary of about $9,161 annually and we know that that is a salary that is below the poverty line. So as students are moving out of high school, we know moving them into post-secondary programs, degree programs, diploma programs are essential to their success. Then if you look at the, go back to the orange um, part of the pie graph, you will note that we still struggle though once students get to post-secondary. Only about um, you know, a fourth of them are actually leaving by the end of that first year of their post-secondary program. And unfortunately, that's directly related to the box, the gray box that's right underneath that smaller pie graph. We have approximately 60% of our students who are entering post-secondary, particularly our community colleges, who are having to take a remedial or developmental course upon entry. And those are typically the ones that are leaving by the end of their first year of their um, college experience. So how does Tennessee Ready, how does Tennessee and Ready actually connect to this knowledge that we have about our students and what happens to them after high school? Well, we know we need to do more to make sure that our students are meeting the higher expectations that we have through our standards in the state by ensuring that we have an assessment that gives us better information about those standards. So T and Ready is a test that gives us more clear and actionable data throughout the student's academic career. It helps us know as a student on track to move on into post-secondary seamlessly um, and be able to walk into a college, again, whichever college they choose, and have the ability to actually do that coursework upon entry. TN Ready also more fully aligns to our standards in that it will give us a full picture of the depth and breadth of the standards that we've had in our state now going on almost five years and it will provide parents and students with better feedback on that pathway toward their college and career goals. TN Ready had three specific goals as we began thinking about what would this specific assessment do for our students and first as, said, as I said earlier this is really about better information about post-secondary readiness. We know we need to have more students ready to go into any of these diploma and degree programs, and we believe this test gives us better information about what true college expectation looks like. It's also a test that gives a better, a full alignment to the depth and breadth of our standards, and it is a Tennessee-specific test. So these transition points this year to meet these goals were, um, you know, many. We had multiple transition points, and as you think about uh, what you've already done this year to get ready for TN Ready, you have probably experienced all of these in some way. We have a variety of new types of test items on TN Ready. This is a test that's given in two parts. The purpose behind those two parts are truly to give us an opportunity to have more of the performance task and writing components in part one, where uh, we know we will have to hand score those and give us uh, more time to do that. Also, we introduced additional tools this year with an opportunity for you to look at questions online through MICA. Our assessment blueprints gave you more information around what would be tested on each part. And then obviously, we'll talk about this a little later, we've had a timeline adjustment for the full scoring process when you go through the first year of a new test. And then finally, a major transition point was um, working to move the entire state to online testing. I wanted you to see a quick example of what a previous TCAT question would look like and what a new TN Ready question might look like. Um, this is a, a good example because it shows you something that's essentially um, testing the same type of standard, the same skills. In the first example, you'll notice on the old TCAP, you would have a multiple choice question. Jennifer has 20 stickers. She separated the stickers into two equal groups. Which model represents the number of heart stickers in each group? And you can see that would be a typical question on the TCAP. So how is TN Ready different? Again, similar type of standard, you have the question, Lucas has 45 pencils. He actually places pencils into five groups using all the pencils. So same kind of question, you're grouping these pencils into equal groups. Each group has the same number of pencils. But the, the actual way the student would answer this is slightly different. 
part A, the student is entering an equation to find the number of pencils represented by the variable P in each group. So this is getting at what does the student think or know about what he would have to do to get to the answer. And then part B, the student is actually giving the answer. So um, a little different type of um, reasoning in part A and part B than what was expected on a multiple choice question back on the TCAP. Here's another example of a grade 7 English language arts question comparing the previous TCAP with TN Ready. You'll note on this one there is a reading passage in both. So on the old TCAP question, the student was reading something called somebody's daughter and answering uh, multiple choice questions related to that particular passage. On the new TN Ready test, the student would be reading an additional passage. This is called Galileo, uh, Galileo and the Lamps. And then there would be multiple questions that go along with that particular reading. The difference would be that these questions would be questions that um, this particular student could um, read more than one passage to particularly get to the answer and would also have an opportunity um, to use different tools in the online environment to help with that particular question. So what has changed in that we are now moving from taking the test in an online environment to a paper environment? We wanted to talk through what's changed and what has stayed the same. Um, so quickly, why did we make a decision to move to the paper-based version of TN Ready um, from a statewide perspective? We had spent uh, the last several months working through a different technology infrastructure and a system preps to make sure our devices and our infrastructure was working appropriately with the online platform provided through our vendor. And that was a, a several months of, of preparation. Uh, we had made discoveries during those months. Um, several of you would experience that we had some iPad challenges and so we made some decisions to not use iPads as part of the statewide testing. Uh, we had other challenges that we worked through with districts. And by the time we worked through those um, particular changes on February 8th, we moved into the testing window for part one that with the ability that we believed um, we could support statewide testing. Then on February 8th, we had an issue that was really operational and procedural in nature that caused the uh, network outage and ultimately it interrupted uh, many students after they had started testing. Uh, some students had completed tests earlier in the morning and then many of them were interrupted at some point on that day. In order to really protect what we felt like were ongoing um, students' instructional times and how we needed to ensure that they had a positive testing experience overall based on what we knew about what happened on February 8th and, and other things we had worked around before February 8th, we decided that we needed to move all of our students to a paper and pencil version of TN Ready. And we felt like that this particular change would allow us to save instructional time and also ensure that we had a positive experience overall. So let's talk about what is different and what's the same on paper. Well, TN Ready on paper is still TN Ready. Uh, because TN Ready on Paper was actually created at the same time um, online versions of TN Ready were created. We have multiple forms and versions of this test and that was created from the beginning in concert with each other. Um, we did have approximately 20 districts that were giving the TN Ready on Paper even as we went into the February 8th time frame for part one of testing. And so um, those two tests, again, paper version and online version, were comparable and created from the beginning uh, together. The questions that students actually practice on the computer when they were preparing for TN Ready in the online format are the same types of questions they would see in the paper version. The difference is that they would not have the technology enhancements, obviously, in the online version um, that, that you were expecting. Otherwise, the content of the questions, the way the questions are laid out, are very similar in nature. We know that many of you were also developing keyboarding and typing skills as you were thinking about preparing for the online environment. Uh, we know that we have state digital literacy expectations uh, all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade, and that matches what our real world demands are. And so the work that you did to prepare your students in an online environment are certainly not lost time. This is what the real world expects, what the real world demands, 
And so the skills that you helped build on uh, will be skills that students will continue to learn from. We know also that many schools upgraded or added technology capabilities and tools. Uh, we believe that those, those types of tools, new de devices, um, upgrades to infrastructure, are all things that can continue to improve the teaching and learning cycle as we introduce more technology into our work. So what does part one look like and what does part two look like? Well, part one in both math and English language arts is a test that replaces what we were doing as the state's writing assessment. And so part one is primarily writing. They're more open-ended written response. These are items that will need to be scored by hand. In math, they include performance tasks in grades three through eight. These are typically multi-step problems that allow students to demonstrate several skills within that uh, particular performance task. The new testing window for part one, based on the transition from online back to paper, is February 22nd through March 18th, and we have had a good number of districts uh, begin the testing window this week. Part two measures skills in multiple ways. The second portion of this particular test will be administered during that typical TCAP end of the year time frame between April 25th and May 6th. On part two, you will see a variety of types of questions. Again, you'll see multiple choice questions like you've seen in the past, some evidence-based questions, and selected response questions where students would select more than one answer or all answers that apply. A reminder that part one counts 20% of the single composite score for each of the TN Ready tests, and part two counts 80% of that single composite score that you will receive on, a, and again, a different timeline that we'll be talking about later this evening. I wanted you to get a chance to see what an answer document would look like in the paper environment. We have put out multiple PDFs of different answer sheets and um, tests that you can look at again in a, in a paper format. This is an example of one. You can see a fraction and a graphing question. The actual question is there on the left side of the screen and what the answer document is, looks like is on the right side of the screen. And so you can see instead of a, a, a Scantron or a bubble in test form for the answer sheet, you actually have an answer document that we've described as looking more like a workbook page where they're actually filling in something that looks very similar to what they're seeing on the question side. We tend to get a, a lot of questions about the accommodations and how might the accommodations for a previous TCAP test be different from what they would uh, have available on TN Ready. The accommodations are available to students served through an IEP or a 504 plan who are English learners like they would have been served under the previous TCAP. Accommodations, as you know, provide equi equitable access during the test and do not alter the content on the test. The accommodations available on last year's TCAP in math and English language arts will also be available on TN Ready, and certainly we've worked with districts and teachers uh, throughout the year to uh, make sure that we have the correct information around accommodations. And finally, while accommodations will be available to students who need it, testing supports are available to all students, and we want to ensure that all students have a positive testing experience. So I'm going to turn over uh, the next couple sections specific to scoring and some of the accountability, flexibility, and transitions um, to our Assistant Commissioner, Dr. Nakia Town. Great. So let's start in a conversation about the scoring, particularly the hand scoring uh, for Part 1 in TN Ready that we um, get lots of questions about. So the um, overview is that our vendor actually handles the scoring for Part 1, uh, and they recruit scores uh, for all of the country to uh, participate in the, in the Tennessee um, assessment scoring. So those applicants um, all must have earned a four-year college degree. They must demonstrate that they can write a competent as well as uh, pass a skills assessment for both English and mathematics uh, and also have a positive track record in terms of recommendations from pre previous employers. employers. Uh, and at the end of that screening process, scores then must also demonstrate that they can actually uh, be aligned to our scoring process in terms of looking at uh, the types of student responses that we have and being able to apply the Tennessee uh, writing rubric uh, to be able to score those responses. 
So those scores, um, once they are selected, they are trained uh, utilizing um, the anchor papers that Tennessee educators participate in. And so the first step of the scoring process is that a group of Tennessee educators come in and actually sit down with actual student responses from uh, that most recent administration. Those educators review those student responses at each grade level, and the educators determine um, for each of those papers what does a one look like, uh, let's say, in focus and organization. What does a four look like for development, uh, so on and so forth, so that they then establish what we call anchor papers. Those anchor papers are what's actually used to train the scores that the vendor hires. So based on Tennessee educators and their view of what a proficient uh, writing assessment looks like, uh, then those scores uh, with the vendors are able to use those anchor papers and align their scoring and calibrate uh, with that scoring. So once that training occurs, then the vendor makes sure that there's ongoing uh, recalibration at the end of every week to be sure that those scores are still aligned uh, to what the expectations that Tennessee educators have set. So the scoring process uh, is, is uh, one that has uh, quite a few uh, steps and checks and balances. So every student response is scored uh, by two independent scores. If there is a disagreement of more than uh, one point um, away between those two scores, then a third score, uh, a third reader actually uh, reviews the paper to determine what the student score would be. In addition to that process, the Department of Education does a percentage of what we call rebinds, where we actually look at, in real time, papers that scores have reviewed and assigned scores to. So um, we look at those rebinds to ensure uh, that we agree with the scores that are being um, uh, awarded for uh, that particular paper. And if there is disagreement uh, in terms of the TDOE staff, we then have the ability to make sure that that particular score is retrained and recalibrated on the rubric uh, if we see that this is a consistent issue and that they're um, not scoring at the expectations set by Tennessee educators, then we can have that score removed from the scoring pool in real time. So I think that the scoring process is one that we make sure first on the screening and selection end that we hire uh, qualified folks. Many of them are uh, former and current educators, retired educators, um, and as well they've demonstrated that they're going to be able to follow the Tennessee rubric in terms of our writing expectations. So now let's move into talking a little bit about accountability during the TN Ready transition. So the first uh, question to deal with is, is with regard to TVAs and thinking about um, how we have the ten Tennessee Value Added Assessment System um, in, during this transition and how this will impact teacher evaluation. So the first thing to, to distinguish is that TVAS actually does not represent achievement. Uh, we have said that we fully expect that we will see a decline in proficiency scores as we transition to TN Ready, but proficiency is very distinct from student growth. Uh, student growth as measured by TVAS is a relative um, performance uh, rank in terms of the student. So it looks at how a student has performed historically uh, in comparison to their peers and whether or not that student has been able to maintain their trajectory uh, in terms of their historical performance. So that means that when there is an overall drop in achievement and in proficiency, let's say, across the state, that does not necessarily result in there being a decline in TVAs. And I think the next slide gives a concrete example of this. So this graphic uh, shows um, what uh, the Algebra 1 content area and looking at three years of data uh, with achievement and um, with TVAs for Algebra 1. So in the first graphic, you see the first pie chart. In 2008-9, before we uh, reset our cut scores for Algebra 1, there were 77% of students were uh, deemed proficient. Uh, and then you can see the distribution of uh, TVAS composites for teachers uh, across the four performance levels, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So then the next year, uh, we actually did reset the cut scores and, and raise the expectations for proficiency for Algebra 1. And you can see the impact of that in that 41% uh, of students were proficient in Algebra 1 versus 77% the prior year. However, when you look at the pie chart in terms of the distribution of teacher effect scores, you notice that it looks very similar to the prior year. 
And this is the point that we've been making, that although there may be an overall decline in achievement, because growth is actually looking at uh, relative performance for the student, we've seen that um, even with those, those changes in achievement, that the growth remains pretty stable. And so when you look at the 2010-11 school year, similarly, you see that we are starting to rebound in terms of proficiency. Proficiency has improved to 47%. And then again, looking at the distribution of TVA scores, you see a very similar dis distribution over the three-year period. So we have historical information uh, that we believe gives us confidence around the fact that TVA scores uh, uh, will have a stability in terms of the overall distribution even as we go through this transition where we expect to see an impact on overall achievement. So how does this uh, affect teacher evaluations? So in last spring, uh, our state legislature passed the Teaching uh, Evaluation and Enhancement and Evaluation Enhancement Act, uh, such that we would be able to adjust uh, the weighting of the growth measure in uh, the teacher summative evaluation score over the transition period. In addition to adjusting uh, that weighting over this three-year transition period, uh, the law also provided complete discretion to local districts in terms of how they would choose to factor in evaluation data um, into employment decisions like promotion, retention, termination, and, com uh, and compensation. So districts have flexibility in terms of how they use the evaluation information, and the law provided that there would be adjustments to the weighting of the growth measure as we go through this transition period. So um, as of uh, the announcement by the governor uh, on last week, uh, we are now proposing to give some additional flexibility with regard to uh, the use of um, the 2015-16 assessment in uh, teacher evaluation for this year. Given the, the uh, transition that the commissioner um, has spoken about in terms of moving to paper pencil, uh, we felt like it was appropriate uh, to make sure that we provided the um, additional flexibility to educators. So the proposal from the, from the governor allows that teachers would be able to include or not include uh, the, the growth measures from this 2015-16 assessment year uh, based on whether or not it benefited them in their summative evaluation score. So in other words, if that 2015-16 data helps in terms of increases your summative evaluation score, then it would be included. If it doesn't, then that data would be excluded. And that um, will be the case over the next three years. So anytime over the next three years, the uh, data from 2015-16 in terms of the growth measure can be excluded from the summative evaluation score if it does not um, help the teacher attain a higher summative score. So let's look at an example. So uh, in the pie chart under option one, you can see the current uh, three-year composite uh, weighting under the Tennessee Teaching Evaluation Enhancement Act. So you see that for a teacher with individual TVOS data, uh, they would have a qualitative component that's 50% of their evaluation. Then the other achievement measure would be 15%. So this is the measure that teachers select. Uh, and then the 35% um, is divided into three components. You can see that the law had already capped uh, the growth from uh, the 15-16 assessment at 10%, and then the remaining components would be from the prior years of data from 2014-15 and 2013-14. So now, option two, if there's a scenario uh, where that TN Ready, uh, the 2015-16 the assessment growth data, was so uh, strong for the teacher that it actually benefited them in their summative evaluation, you can see an option two that the full 35% could be used uh, based on the 2015-16 growth measure. So if that helps the teacher uh, achieve a higher summative evaluation score, then the prior data from TVOS would be excluded and all the, uh, the entire 35% growth measure would be based on 2015-16. Now, option three shows if um, TN Ready results actually don't benefit the teacher. So in that case, you see that the 2015-16 assessment data actually falls out of the growth measure, and instead the growth measure is based on the two prior years, 2014-15 and 2013-14. 
So again, over the next three years, uh, it will always be that the growth measure will be uh, evaluated based on including the 2015-16 year or excluding it, and the teacher will get the better of those two results in terms of their summative evaluation score. So in terms of the impact um, of this flexibility, this is, is a proposal that is working its way through the General Assembly. So uh, many of the details in terms of how we're going to operationalize this are still being uh, determined. Uh, but as soon as we get to a place where a final bill has been passed and adopted, the department will uh, share that detailed information uh, soon thereafter. So we are working through the legislative process and we'll get out the details soon thereafter. The other piece of flexibility around this TN Ready transition year will, is around um, integrating the TCAP results in student grades. So last year, the General Assembly passed a law that said if uh, quick scores, which is what we note um, the scores that we uh, generate from the department to use in student grading information, if those quick scores aren't available at least five days before the end of the instructional period, be it the semester or the year, then districts have the flexibility to choose to exclude that information from student grades. So we communicated at the beginning of the year uh, that quick scores this year would be delayed. And so as a result of that, many uh, local districts have taken the opportunity to adopt policies uh, that allow them uh, to take action on excluding those TN Ready results from student grades this year. So uh, districts have that flexibility and many of them have already moved on it. So um, as we move through the transition, um, let's talk a little bit more about one of the goals for TN Ready, which is around providing better information about uh, students uh, being on track for post-secondary and career inf information. Um, so when we look at uh, what we really want in terms of um, the benefits of TN Ready, we believe that we will be able to provide more and better information about student performance to both parents and educators. So student reports, these individual student reports will be available uh, in the fall of this year. Again, we'll have a little bit of delayed time frame while we have teachers participate in determining those proficiency levels. And when we design these new reports, we're keeping three things in mind. One, we want to make sure that we prioritize the most important information and prevent information overload. Two, we want to make sure that we support families and educators uh, with information to help them, help, help them interpret uh, the scores and be able to act on it uh, to support students. And then finally, we want to offer more context in terms of student performance uh, uh, to make sure that that guidance is clear and actionable. So in order to ensure that we really uh, live out our vision in terms of this improved reporting, we are uh, contacting and engaging parents and teachers from across the state to provide us feedback um, in terms of focus groups on the format of the new reports. Uh, we're also talking uh, to educators about how might we redefine uh, the performance levels. Uh, instead of using terms like proficient and below basic, we really have a lot of feedback that parents want uh, to use terminology that really uh, tell them more about how their student is performing and it's just a little bit more intuitive than the performance level names that we've had in the past. So with that, you can see where we've been. This is the historical uh, TCAP report um, uh, that's on your screen now. Uh, I liken it to like the credit card uh, uh, insert that you get with your bill each month, the fine print that none of us read. We just want to pay on time and hope everything works out. So we want to move away from this uh, you know, fine print, very overwhelming reporting uh, that we've had on historical TCAP. So moving forward, here's an example of just one of the mock-ups that we're sharing with educators and parents to provide us feedback on what might a better report look like. So you can immediately see on this version of a TN Ready report um, that the student's performance level um, is very clear in terms of uh, where Janet is performing on the English 1 assessment. You can see that we've added color uh, to be able to engage folks with the information more readily. And then you see those four performance levels have very different names than the advanced, proficient, uh, basic, and below basic that we've had before. So this is just one example and we're getting feedback of multiple versions of a potential report. On the back side of this report, what's also new and different is that we've highlighted 
for parents, uh, strengths and areas of improvement uh, for Janet uh, so that they can determine um, what might they need to support Janet on and really highlight the things that she's done well. Um, there's clear next steps that parents might be able to take uh, in the gray box. And then you can see uh, a performance comparison where uh, Janet's parents and, and teachers can uh, understand how she scored compared to other students um, taking the English 1 assessment in her school, in her district, and in the state. And then finally, you get a little bit more granular information in terms of those scoring categories, uh, where you can see whether or not uh, Janet was at or above expectations um, or at or above mastery or below mastery in each of those different scoring categories. So we do think that this information uh, that is presented uh, is definitely a step forward uh, in terms of what we've had historically and we are continuing to gather feedback from parents and educators so that we can design really an optimal uh, report for individual student results. So moving forward, um, we've talked about how uh, the timeline for Tea and Ready is one that is adjusted and delayed this year because it's the first year of, of a new assessment. And so there are some things that uh, we are having to do as we launch a new assessment uh, that means that we won't get back uh, the student results in the same uh, timeline that we've expected in terms of the summer. So some of these steps we've already taken in terms of um, introducing uh, educators uh, to, and parents to be able to provide feedback on those uh, student reports. Um, we've also uh, been engaging educators already in range finding uh, to be able to score uh, those um, hand scored items. Uh, we are currently uh, uh, opening or in the part one testing window on paper so that opened um, for many districts uh, this week uh, and will go through March 18th. And then, of course, in the spring, we'll have the part two components, which will open up at the end of April. And then we'll get into the summer work where we really start to engage educators around uh, what we call the standard setting process, where Tennessee educators come in and determine uh, how we will uh, uh, set those uh, different uh, cutoffs for the performance levels for students. So one of the other things um, that we've noted is, as we've already said, quick scores will be delayed. And then we expect that we will get back um, those full student reports and district results will be coming back sometime in the fall, the September, October time frame uh, for this information for the first year of TN Ready. So a little bit of a delayed time frame this year, uh, but we are hopeful that the reporting and the information that we get for students will be um, information that really will help to inform uh, uh, the work going forward and that as we move into the second year of TN Ready that we'll resume to our normal timeline. So we are continuing to update resources and guidance on our website. Um, so many of the materials uh, that we've provided, the parent guide and the teacher guide, uh, many of the FAQs um, that we've created, we've uh, cataloged all of those things and they're available at the tnready.gov. So for the most up-to-date information, we encourage you to visit the website um, where you can find, again, uh, the latest updates and many of these resources that include brochure, brochure brochures, one-pagers, um, and other handouts that can support uh, educators and parents around what does this transition to TN Ready look like. So with that, I think we are ready to open it up for questions. I know there are some students who finish their Part 1 tests online. How are those tests being handled? So we did have um, about 20,000 students who were able um, to actually successfully submit their Part 1 online on Monday, February 8th. So for those students, we've already notified districts that those students will not need to retake Part 1 on paper pencil. So we will use those results from those students and actually um, incorporate it into their overall score for TN Ready so that those students don't have to retake of the assessment. If there were any students who actually began part one online on Monday, February 8th, who were not able to finish, we uh, will have those students participate in the paper pencil part one so that they can have a completed part one score to be able to include in their overall T and ready score. Thank you. Yeah, and let me um, just introduce who we have asking the questions tonight. This is Lee Cooksey. Uh, Lee is our teacher ambassador in the Department of Education, and she is always available to answer questions via email. And so Lee is actually 
uh, taking your questions online, and um, we'll be answering those over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you, Commissioner. How are districts scheduling the paper test for Tea and Ready? Um, particular, particularly, we've received some questions about ELA Part 1 and what that will look like with the paper test. Well, first I would say um, the paper testing window started um, this past Monday on February 22nd. We do have approximately 96 districts now that do have the, the paper version of the test in hand. Um, other districts will be continuing to receive those paper tests over the next uh, week and a half to two weeks. And so everyone will have up through March 18th for completion of that. If you look at the uh, writing prompts in the ELA version of the test, then you will note that you'll see the writing prompt and then the students will have lined paper um, to answer the writing prompt. They'll, they'll have the passage to read and the actual prompt and they will be addressing it on an answer page that is lined paper. And they will have as many of those as they need. Great, thank you. What will this proposed accountability adjustment look like for science and social studies teachers? So the accountability adjustment that we discussed will be applicable for science and social studies teachers as well. So the language of the proposal uh, simply refers to 2015-16 assessments. So the same uh, type of flexibility that's being provided to teachers of ELA and math is also being provided to science and social studies teachers. Wonderful. And, and Brad also, um, to add to that, Brad asked about what about the flexibility for first year teachers? What might that 35% look like for them? So according to the Teaching uh, Evaluation Enhancement Act, for uh, first year teachers, um, the law defined that at a maximum, only 10% would be available from uh, the 2015-16 assessment, uh, including and ready. Now, in the current proposal, we are uh, looking at for teachers who do really well, first year teachers who do really well with TN Ready, uh, that they would be able to also use that growth measure for 35% of their summative score if it helps them. So, since that um, first year teacher doesn't have any historical data, if there isn't, um, if TN Ready results uh, uh, don't uh, improve their summative evaluation scores, then it would be eliminated completely, and that teacher would have 85% of their summative evaluations or based on qualitative data and then 15% based on the other achievement measure that they selected. Great, thank you. Tracy's asked a good question about assessment transparency. Um, she thinks it would be helpful to be able to look at some of the questions and her student responses. Will teachers have access to assessment questions and student responses? Well, Tracy, I appreciate the question. Uh, we have something called the Assessment Transparency Act that is currently moving through the House and the Senate uh, right now. The um, Assessment Transparency Act was based on an assessment task force that we put together back in the spring, and that task force uh, was clear that we needed to have more of an opportunity to see the actual questions on the state standardized test as well as student answers. And so uh, we have every hope that bill will be passed and that we will be able to move forward um, not this summer, but the following year with the ability to actually uh, publish the questions that were part of the um, uh, TCAP assessments as well as student answers and, and obviously the questions that were attached to those answers, those would be delivered to districts and would be um, given to students and to parents as, uh, certainly as well as to teachers. And so we're looking forward to in a year having the ability not only with this bill passing but funding associated with it where we could uh, put out probably close to 70% of all the test items yearly. Um, as you know, some of the test items are field test items or linking items that we use uh, cross tests to uh, make sure that we have a valid and reliable test. But ultimately, we will be able to publish the majority of those questions and also give students and parents the answers to those questions and did they get it right or wrong and what was the right answer. Great news, thank you. Christina's asked about the high school students who were um, able to successfully take um, their assessment on block schedule last semester online. Um, she's asking about quick scores when we expect to hear um, more about those. Yes, so we um, actually had to delay the quick scores just a bit when we transitioned back from um, online to paper. 
we were expecting to get out the, the block schedule quick scores, I believe, the week of February 8th um, as a result of this switch and, and having to change some attention within the department to move to the paper testing. We had to delay the quick score results, but we actually um, have the quick scores ready. We have analyzed them, and they are going out to districts through the assessment coordinators tomorrow. Um, directors got an email today that just shared that that's coming tomorrow access those, as well as assuring that when you look at a quick score, um, there's always a caution, and, and I want to share that caution with um, any of the educators who are on, on this webinar. Uh, quick scores right now in a new version of a test, they're not associated with any cut scores. The standard setting process has not taken place, and so uh, to make really any assumptions about those quick scores, um, it's just too premature, and so our work will be certainly to get you the quick scores, those are embargoed. Um, they're embargoed um, on a need-to-know basis at the district level. So educators, um, certainly administrators at the district level who get those can use those for uh, decision making, but they are embargoed and um, they are not associated with any cut score. They're not associated with any of the standard setting process yet. That will still all take place during the summer months. And so more information would be forthcoming on what those scores even mean. Um, by the end of the summer and early fall. Thank you. I've heard some fellow English teachers ask about spelling since students will not have spell check um, like they would with the online assessment. Can you speak to that a little bit, Nakia? Yes. So um, uh, in the um, writing rubric, uh, when you think about the, uh, the two traits, language and conventions, um, uh, you all know the emphasis has been on uh, really student use of, of, of grammar and language conventions where spelling has really been uh, uh, less of an emphasis. So uh, that's why we were able to provide spell check because frankly it's, it's not the skill that we're really assessing. So from the perspective of the scoring, we ask students to be brave with their words as vocabulary is really um, more uh, of the issue in terms of if they're using phonetic or uh, phonetic or inventive spelling, that will be just fine. All of the scores only score a particular grade level. Uh, so uh, when that range finding process happens with Tennessee educators, they they will set guidance around um, uh, essentially looking at scoring uh, less than, than the emphasis on the holistic view of the student construction of the essay. So, uh, and a third grade uh, rater will only be looking at other third grade papers, so they're not going to uh, compare the spelling of a third grader to the spelling of a seventh grader. So um, that's one of uh, the scenarios where we ask that teachers just give students the guidance to be, again, brave with their words um, and don't, you know, spelling, it's not a spelling test. It's actually a, a writing assessment. I love that phrase, brave with their words. Mm -hmm. I'm going to steal that from the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, we have a great question here from JC, an observation with a follow-up question. He says that the department's been proactive um, with the failure of the online version of TN Ready. He wants to know if we're still going to move forward with that in the future. Absolutely. Our goal is to continue to move forward with online testing, um, to learn from the experiences that we've had this year. Also to gain more knowledge from educators on the ground and students on the ground and their experiences that um, would help inform us as we move forward with not only the logistics side of scheduling online, but the platform of performance and capabilities that our educators and our students desire. And then thinking about what is an appropriate uh, timeline and phase in based on where we currently are. But absolutely, we will continue to move forward with online testing. Oh, thank you. We have several teachers asking about science, that follow-up question that I asked a few moments ago, and they would just like for us to clarify a little bit that um, with this new proposed accountability piece that science teachers will have that same flexibility. Um, and also we have a follow-up question on SAT 10, um, teachers who use that assessment in their buildings along with early grades teachers. So yes, the, the law applies to any 2015-16 assessment. So it will encompass teachers who are K-2 if your district uses SAT-10 and all content areas including science. So the flexibility is being provided to any teacher that generates an individual TBOS score that they will be able to exclude data from 2015-16 if that data does not um, improve their summative evaluation. Great, thank you. We also have a follow-up question on that 15% achievement measure. 
what will that look like um, with this new proposed accountability legislation if a teacher had selected an achievement measure that is impacted by TN Ready scores? So the department has provided uh, districts the flexibility to provide teachers the option to select another 15% uh, achievement measure if they desire to do so. Um, so again, that's a district option, and even if the district opens up the option, it is to the teacher's discretion as to whether or not they want to change their 15% selection. If a teacher uh, does remain with a growth measure, a school-wide growth measure for their 15% selection, that growth measure will be incorporated into uh, their summative evaluation score. So it is a teacher choice. Districts have the option to reopen that selection process, uh, and whatever the teacher selects, including TVOS, will be used in the 15% achievement measure. Yes, and I want to follow up on that, that we have sent out an initial FAQ on um, this additional flexibility. Um, we have a, another FAQ that will come out very soon. We're hoping that at least by the end of next week that gives more detail on some of these additional questions that, that we've certainly had. Um, we're waiting to send that out until our proposal is actually moving through um, on the, the General Assembly side um, so that you can actually get the same information that's being proposed in that language. So additional, uh, you know, forthcoming information will give you as much as soon as we can. Um, hopefully by the end of next week. There are some additional um, information that's already out. There's an initial FAQ that gives some graphics that uh, Dr. Town showed earlier in the PowerPoint slide. Those have all gone to the districts. Thank you. Nikia, could you clarify again um, how scoring works? Um, Summers asked a question about if scores don't agree on a score. So I know you touched on this a little bit in the presentation. I just want to see if we could circle back to that and talk a little bit more about what happens. Yes, so every student response is rated by two scores. And so if those two scores have a disagreement in terms of uh, non-adjacent scores, so if they are more than one point different, then the scoring goes to a third uh, score for review. Uh, and the third score is typically a team leader for that scoring uh, group, and that team leader scores then becomes uh, the final word in terms of uh, the scores for that student. And that was to clarify, that's if there's more than one point difference? Yes. Mm -hmm. What if there is one point difference? So in the case of one point difference, students get the benefit of the, the better of the score. Um, so uh, only when there's a two point difference is it, is it severe enough for there to be a third score to calibrate. Great. Thank you. Rose has asked about plans for the future and um, what part one and two, the structure of that, might look like moving um, forward in future years? So I'll start by answering that question that, that we uh, obviously will learn a lot this year and so uh, we would hate to be definitive on, definitive on exactly what part one and part two would look like without having actually gone through that with the vast majority of our students across Tennessee. But what we do know is that um, certainly in both social studies and in English language arts, part one is fairly critical because you are um, asking students to give more of a, a response in writing. It's a constructed um, essay, essentially, and those need to be hand scored. So we need to have them done in time to provide hand scoring to part one, and we believe having that uh, done during uh, the month of February, late February, early February is, is fairly important to get it on the timeline where you have part one and part two scored somewhat simultaneously and ready for our teachers as soon as possible. Um, I, I would say secondly though we have learned from um, what we've been able to do with part one in math that there could be some opportunities to collapse the part one of math with part two and provide those performance items in part two and be able to machine score those differently than what we are going to be able to do certainly with, with social studies and English language arts. So we're looking at the potential of um, eliminating part one in math going forward and then obviously looking at how do you uh, continue to streamline part one for both um, social studies and English language arts, but knowing that it's critical that we have these more constructive response um, type questions in part one in both of those two subject areas. So that's uh, current thinking, but we again will go through this process this year. We will learn a lot from the feedback that we hear, the results that we get, and we will continue to work with our teachers to make decisions about next year. Thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions. First, we have a clarifying question from Brandy um, about what 
this new um, accountability flexibility will look like for non-tested teachers? So for non-tested teachers, uh, the Teaching Evaluation Enhancement Act uh, allowed that 15% uh, of that summative evaluation would be based on a school-wide growth measure, and that 15% would be the other achievement measure that the teacher uh, selects. So in the case of this uh, flexibility year for 2015-16, uh, as we know, the school-wide growth measure is only a one-year measure. So if that one-year measure based on 2015-16 assessment data uh, for the growth measure for a non-tested teacher, if that does not uh, improve their summative evaluation score, then that teacher would be able to eliminate that 15% based on a school-wide growth measure, and their summative evaluation would be based on 85% qualitative measures and the 15% other student achievement measure that they selected. Thank you. And our last question is about educator involvement in this assessment. I know you mentioned educators being involved in processes like range finding. Can you speak a little bit about how Tennessee teachers have been involved um, in the development and the scoring of this assessment? Yes, so really from um, the very beginning, Tennessee educators have been involved. So the first step uh, is what we call item review. So uh, we solicited and had teachers apply to be a part of our item review committees. Uh, we had three committees that were item review based on standards alignment, uh, bias, uh, and sensitivity review in terms of um, looking at any type of um, cultural biases that may uh, come uh, into play. And then we have a committee that reviews for assessment ability uh, to make sure that students with different uh, disabilities um, are able to access uh, the, the content in the item uh, and making sure that it doesn't disadvantage those students. So teachers have been participating in that item review such that they have uh, determined which items would be eliminated before we would even consider adding them to a form. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, after the item review, teachers have also been uh, involved in the range finding process. So teachers are helping to make sure that uh, the uh, scoring, the hand scoring, uh, is appropriate to Tennessee expectations by creating anchor papers that define what student performance looks like at each level across the traits. We've also had uh, educators involved in uh, the process for performance level descriptors. So as we talked about those performance levels like advanced, proficient, uh, the first step in being able to determine the cut scores is to set what do we mean at each of those different uh, four performance levels. So educators are participating in setting uh, what we've defined as the policy uh, performance level descriptors. And then the next phase will be the range performance level descriptors, which get more uh, specific to a particular content area and grade band. And then, of course, those will be used for the educators who participate in standard setting this summer, where they actually sit um, in uh, particular roundtables to determine what the cut scores will be uh, for each content area and grade level. So those teachers in standard setting will determine what we consider uh, they, we call them threshold performance level descriptors, where they actually determine what is the threshold to move from uh, below basic to basic, to move from basic to proficient, and from proficient to advanced. And so those teachers will make the determination as to what are those actual cut scores for each of the performance level. Uh, so teachers have been involved from the beginning in terms of the item review and selection process, then in terms of the scoring process, determining the performance level expectations, and finally uh, with the setting of the actual cut scores for uh, student performance. And I would add that we will continue to engage educators going forward as we review this first year of TN Ready. Um, are the department plans to put out a report around what we learned about the first year, um, what that transition was like, um, particularly giving some insight on what we believe are um, recommendations, areas for improvement, what are areas that we felt like were very strong, um, strengths of the test, and, and did it do what we set out for it to do. So we will be engaging with educators to get feedback in those areas as well. Great. Thank you both. Um, we do see that we have several questions from participants about how they will access this webinar later on. So we're going to let um, Bethany address that for us. Thank you all for your great questions. Yes. I'm glad that you said that because I was going to bring that up. This session is recorded, and what I will do is to, um, it's raw footage, and I will convert that to uh, our um, YouTube channel 
ProEd TN is our YouTube channel, and also I have all, all of your emails, so I will be able to email you this presentation. You're welcome to share it with your school, with your faculty, and whoever you think could benefit from watching this, but this is available to all educators, and we're delighted to have you, and I will give a free commercial. I'm in charge of professional training, and I would love to have, see you at our Leader U 2016 at um, the Franklin Cool Springs Marriott on June 11th. So if you want more information about that, our website is www.leaderutn.com. Thank you and good evening, and I will be sending you a copy of this presentation.